Hi, I'm Adam Thompson, the interviews editor of the Oxford Blue. Today we're honoured to be joined by James Carville, a titan of the Democratic Party over in the United States. He managed Bill Clinton's successful long shot run for president in 1992 uh, and since remained a high profile figure in American public life. Uh, and as someone who can usually command tens of thousands of pounds per hour in speaking fees for his engagements, we're extremely grateful that he's taken the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much, James. Well, thank you. You know, I was at Oxford uh, last year twice. I think I was in June and I was back in November. And I see that you guys are kind of leading the, the search for the vaccine. So I'm like pulling for LSU football, but I'm pulling from other school, Oxford, to get there first. Let's get it over the finish line, guys. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's pump up the guys in the lab. <laughs> I should say the, the guys and the gals in the lab, because I'm sure they're, they're oh, plenty uh, of both. So uh, I'm uh, pulling for uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I feel like I appreciate that, James. Um, right. Actually, can we start there, actually? So with, when your last um, visit to Oxford in, in October, you came to speak to the Oxford Union uh, about uh, impeachment. Uh, and, and you made the case that you thought that um, given all the stuff that had come out, you know, the, the famous cool transcript and the like, that in, impeachment would ultimately serve to hurt Trump electorally. Um, with hindsight, do you still think that was the case? Well, I, I, think, I think it's hurt. I mean, it, certainly there was some fear that impeachment would help Trump. It, there would be a backlash. Clearly, that did not happen. And clearly, looking at events, I think the Democrats did the right thing. It was without political consequence during impeachment. We won a governor's race in Louisiana. We won a governor's race in Kentucky. If there was going to be any adverse effect, you would have seen it there. Right now, there's literally not a poll that I see, and I, and I see them all, that doesn't show Biden ahead or Biden winning in so-called swing states. Um, I think the margin of victory, and I, I just posted a piece, it's on a site called NBC Think, but it's gotten good circulation over here. Uh, that makes the point that if Biden just runs an okay campaign, he will probably win. If he runs a good campaign, he will win by more. And I, I, I think a good campaign is akin to a pirate ship. It, it's always looking for advantage. It's always calculating wind speed. It's always calculating wind direction. It, it doesn't meet very much. It doesn't pontificate. It's just, it's just trying to seize advantages as you see them. And I hope that they adapt that kind of aggressive mentality during the course of this campaign, because if they do, they can be really quite successful. Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think it's probably it's probably worth pointing out that you didn't start supporting Biden. So originally you endorsed no. and, and stumped for, for, for Michael Bennett. Could you sort of just just lay, lay out what advantages you saw at the time as, as him having over a more established candidate like Joe Biden? Well, what I saw was is that it was seeming it would seem likely at point, particularly in, in January, you know, at the end of January, that. Bernie Sanders would go to Milwaukee, remember at that time we thought we were going to have a convention, with a plurality, not a majority of the Democrats. Mm -hmm. and, and it became apparent that the only way to stop that was Joe Biden, who I like and never said a completely honorable man with an honorable life in politics. And once my friend Congressman Clyburn dropped a hammer in South Carolina, well, that was the end of that. And then what happened was, is once Joe Biden won in South Carolina, the entire Democratic electorate said, we got a nominee, let's get the hell out of here. So you started seeing these massive victories in Virginia and Mississippi and Michigan and places like that. And at that point, it became very clear that the Democratic voters were talking, were expressing their opinion and expressing it very authoritatively. So. I became a big advocate of unifying the party behind a single goal, which is I, anybody that's heard me speak, I'm not very bashful about it, and that is getting this incompetent career criminal out of office. Right. And I, that, that's that's right. That's where it end up, and that's my journey. And it, it and I knew from just instinctively in polling that the number one thing Democrats want they didn't want a revolution. They want they wanted to get Trump out of there. And, and that's what happened. And we just got to stay united. And, you know, we're, we could win very big in, in November. We need a decisive win. And it's it's possible. It's very possible. No, for sure. I, I mean, there's 
I've I, I've sort of I, I've heard, heard you talk uh, back in February. I, I think you said at the time that the fate of the world depends on the Democrats getting their shit together and winning in November. We have to beat Trump, and so far I don't like what I see. But but I, I take the clearly you you've, precisely you have quoted me accurately and in context. I stand a hundred percent by every word of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but and, and and now obviously with with the the unification of the party. Uh, behind Biden, um, Sanders, um, staying on the ballot, but but withdrawing from from the presidential race and the the sort of somewhat complex maneuver that he pulled there, but but that ultimately means that Biden will be the nominee. That, that that's something that I guess it has given you this optimism. Am, am I right in thinking that it's, it's Biden as the candidate as opposed to sort of the chaos you were expecting from the convention? Yeah, I, I mean it's it's, it's, a, it's it's evident now. I mean you're always going to have. There's always going to be some carping and backbiting, and that kind of stuff goes to the territory. I, I think that what's going on in the United States, about take a, a point of personal privilege here to make a point. I think the corruption that is going around all of this stimulus, the, the Federal Reserve putting a half billion dollars out there, I think the corruption that's going to be attendant to this is going to be staggering. And I hope that, that Vice President Biden starts putting, starts talking about how as president he's going to fight this corruption. I, 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 my, my, I actually think it would be a really smart move to, make a, to announce that Elizabeth Warren will be his attorney general with the job to be doggone sure that this money is distributed in, in, in a lawful way to the people that need it. And some of the early things that I'm seeing is it's going to a lot of people that don't need it, and a lot of people that need it are not getting it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a superb campaign issue. I think the corruption in this administration has been on a scale that, that we haven't seen maybe at any time in this country. And I think people know that. And if we're ever going to have any confidence in in anything, and particularly our government, we got to know that this 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 issue is being dealt with. And I, I think it's a great campaign issue. I think it's a great governing issue. I think at the core, the the it's just it's just the corruption is just so endemic all all over the country and all over this administration. It, it, it's it, it's staggering. It's sort of even hard to even contemplate that. It, you know, you, you see where Trump is. You know, it's China all the time. Everything. Well, come to find out, he owes the State Bank of China, which is owing the government of China, $221 million due in 2022. I mean, you couldn't pass a security check. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't be a, a, a Lance Corporal and see anything, any sensitive information if, if in your security check, they determined that you owed the government of China money. <laughs> What are we talking about here? <laughs> but it's true. I mean, uh, I, simultaneously, though, you, you do touch on a point, a, a point there about sort of Warren as a, a potential attorney general. Of course, uh, the, the sort of ongoing, I guess, hot topic in, in Washington is is the vice presidential um, right. pick for, for, from uh, for, from Joe Biden, and and uh, Warren's obviously been mentioned. I, I, there's you know other names we talked about, talked about Kamala Harris, um, sort of Gretchen Whitmer. Um, I, do you have any sort of sort of view on yeah. who will be beneficial to, to Biden? You know, it, it, it's all speculation. I'd from this is just me personally, because I think corruption is going to be the dominant issue for a while. I think she can do ten times as much good as Attorney General and Vice President. I mean, she is really smart, and mm -hmm. she's the only person I know that is smarter than all of these corporate people and bankers that contrive all of this stuff, and. I, you know, and I think that if, you know, she, if she's in power, that's, but that's my idea. It's that no, you know, I'm glad to, to share it with people. I think it makes sense. Look, in terms of the vice presidential nomination, you know, Senator Chris Dyes, a dear friend of mine, is heading up to share the, the search. I, I think Senator Mastos in Nevada is somebody that's going to deserving of a good, hard look. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, Senator Harris and, and uh, uh, Stacey Abrams in Georgia, he has said it's going to be a woman, a big fan of Governor, Governor Whitmer. I, I wrote a piece in the FT a couple of months ago 
uh, really praising her. And somebody runs for governor and her slogan is fix the damn roads. Well, you're kind of James Carville person. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of that's the kind of politics I like. That kind of elementary. Let's get out here and you know get the job done that matters to people. Uh, you know there'll be there'll be others. Like Senator Klobuchar. You know we'll see as this process goes out. One of the things that he could do these are extraordinary times. Maybe he might say something that I'm putting my team together. I want you to know who it is and. Uh, Senator Harris is going to be Secretary of State. Senator Warren's going to be the Attorney General. You know, uh, I don't know. General McChrystal is going to be the Secretary of Defense. Uh, so, sort of uh, Stacey Abrams is going to be the Secretary of the Interior. I don't know, but maybe if, if you wanted to to do something like that, and I think the public would kind of like that kind of thing. Normally. We don't do that in American politics, and I've never been for it. People suggested it to us. And the normal thing you do is you wait as close to the convention as you can to build up suspense, and you announce your vice president, and you move on. The one thing I do know, these are not normal times. This is not the, this is not the time in politics to act like people used to act. This is a time in politics because we're faced with different challenges, I mean, significantly different challenges, and maybe it's time to act differently and to the extent i have a role you know i'll throw a lot of stuff out there you know when i think the idea is to try to be you know to talk about being a pirate ship that's just what you got to do this is not as a nasty business <laughs> no no absolutely I, I mean still still within that like, sort of we are obviously still qu qu quite some way from from the election in in what remains a an unprecedented sort of campaign, right? In in the sense that we uh, we've got no idea sort of what form the convention will take at this point. Uh, right. We're not sure, uh, you know, about a large number of factors depending on things like you know on coronavirus that we have no control over at the moment. But uh, is it? Uh, I've I, I've I've heard you speak sort of quite uh, positively and optimistically about Biden's chances, and and, cl and clearly you, you still take that to be the case. But uh, I, I would sort of sort of. I, I guess like to press you on I guess uh, some of the uh, the flaws of, of Biden potentially as a candidate that, that could uh, can you come out, come out as he faces greater scrutiny uh, sort of emerges from his basement in Delaware where he's currently holed up um, during coronavirus uh, and, and, and faces more sort of scrutiny from the press. Um, so I, I mean, do you, do you think sort of a candidate who uh, is being attacked already I guess by the Trump campaign on the pretty consistent line that he uh, judging by, uh, based on his 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 public uh, occasional struggles to express himself eloquently, that he's sort of mentally failing, and that in turn that uh, his presidency will become some Trojan horse from the the far left of the uh, Democratic Party to infiltrate government. How, how, how would you sort of see him sort of faring in, in in response to these sort of attacks? Okay, well, first of all, we know that the attacks are going to be coming and they're going to be vicious, right? Second thing is, some attacks you may choose to respond to very aggressively, some not so aggressively. But remember one thing, you can attack. It's not just, it's not just them that get to attack. And you can attack in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really pointed, surgical, effective way. And, and you're right, he is in his basement. Trump is there every day having his news conference, and every day it gets worse and worse. And I just don't see, at the end of the day, the choice is going to be, do you want the next four years, the next four years to look like the last four? If it gets framed like that, by, and that's the way it's going to get framed, right? you have a choice. You can continue with what you have, or you can try something different. The, 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 the greatest word in the English language, in any Challenges political campaign is drum roll, please. Change, change. Just Joe Biden because it's time for a change. And you know the great thing about the word change? You could write an Oxford student could write an essay of a thousand words on a thousand different meanings of change. You want change in demeanor. You want change in the economy. You want change in expertise. You want change in foreign policy. You want change in climate policy. You you can take the word and you can fit it 
to anything you want to be. Mm-hmm. And, and clearly, the, the momentum in the United in U.S. politics is far change. And yeah. everything that he attacks, this is the same when he attacks with his crude crap. This is the same thing we've been hearing for the last three and a half years. Do you want to hear this for four more years or you want some optimism? Do you want to hear this for four more years or you want somebody that tries to unify the country? Do you want to hear this for four more years or you want to keep up the name calling? I mean, this is not that hard. Uh, and they're making it hard. At the same time, though, James, uh, how how do you feel that Biden acts as a sort of a, a vessel for change? Because obviously he's uniquely placed as right. effectively the, the second most senior member of the last administration is is the fear not that, that he becomes a, a rather than a message of change or something new, a message of go back to what it was four years ago under the conditions in which Trump was re-elected? So was that- it, it, it's, it's very good to say, James, look, he's 76 years old, he's a former vice president, he was an establishment senator for X number of years. But he, the kind of change I think that Biden is talking about is kind of a, a return to decency and confidence. Mm-hmm. And I think that he can represent both. I mean, is it going to be the kind of change that we sort of see that we talked about in 1992 or Barack Obama talked about in 2008? No. But again, change is a word that is not singular in its meaning and is not singular in its interpretation. So, in, by the way, if, if you look at across the United States, you look at what's happening, look at the governors who are really succeeding. All right, let's take my own governor, John Bell Edwards. Right? Louisiana was hit with the most brutal infection rates you could imagine. And the reason is, is because it, we had no reason. They never told us anything. We had Mardi Gras, which was just nothing but a giant incubation pit. And now, I mean, the curve, we've not only flattened the curve, the curve has gone down. John Bell, daddy was a sheriff which is the most political position you can imagine in Louisiana. The sheriffs are elected, and they're not appointed, and they have tremendous power in, in, a, in a fairly significant parish. He went to West Point. He was the head of the honor committee. He was an army ranger. He came back. He went to LSU Law School. He was the minority leader of the Democrats in the Louisiana legislature. He is a politician. Andrew Cuomo's daddy was a governor of New York, all right? They know him. Mike DeWine is 73 years old in Ohio, doing a hell of a job, a Republican. He was an attorney general. He's been in politics all his life. The, the, the poli- you know, the politicians are the people that are doing the best. In, and at a level, people understand that. I mean, you think of the great people. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt was just an unbelievable politician. A, a friend of mine, Sidney Blumenthal, was writing a five-volume history on Abraham Lincoln, the politician. People are actually, the change is, is we're going to have somebody that understands politics and understands coalitions putting this together. Mm-hmm. It, it's just what it is. It's where, what people are looking for right now. At, at, at this moment in our history, they're not looking for some 37-year-old, go get them, you know, Elon Musk kind of guy. It's just not where they are. Mm-hmm. And what they see working, you know, you're looking at the same thing in the UK. Look, look at the disastrous decisions that the British Labour Party had made. When I was at the debate at, at Oxford in November, everybody was saying, if, you know, one of the Milibans would have been the leader of the Labour Party. They'd be, they'd be in, in power now. To go off out of somewhere, you look what you end up with. I mean, that, that these these decisions that you make, that they're decisions that have consequence. And there's this idea that well, it doesn't matter. Everybody is so. It's what I call political Presbyterianism. That the outcome of an election is decided by demographics, and it doesn't matter who the candidate. What horse shit? I mean, it really is. I mean, think about it. Think of can, the world can I, global. Can, can I can I put the, the the sort of the alternate case to you? I guess that sort of look at some of the weaknesses of 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 of, of Biden and the party in general at the moment. Right. As we yeah. Election season. So so yeah. I, I guess the, the key case would be to say that the, the party is like not still not unified. I um, mean, polling on generic de- Democrats consistently outpolls um, Biden's own polling figures. 
uh, you know, still a significant chunk of some supporters exist who haven't yet come home with little evidence they actually will do so. And whilst Trump has largely aligned the Republican Party behind him after four years in office, so so which would appear to indicate potentially sort of lower Democratic turnout, higher Republican turnout, and in turn, even if a majority of the country would broadly agree with 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 the message of we want something different, uh, plausibly the, the majority of the country at the ballot box, or rather the majority of the country in the key swing states, um, which still obviously uh, are, are, are far closer than than the polling in the rest of the country. Um, as a whole would suggest, um, they, they, the majority of the country, the ballot, sorry, the majority in the ballot boxes in the, in those key like swing states may well still fall in favour of Trump. All right, let, let's go to the first observation, which is important and correct, that congressional Democrats are doing better in the polling than Joe Biden is. Mm-hmm. In the most people believe, as do I believe, it, it's hard with this kind of you know, because out without pacing them by two points, maybe, you know, three points. It, there is a real danger of a third party candidate that would take votes away from Biden. It, you saw it in, in, in 2016 where Jill Stein, who was funded by the Russians, please, look, just all Google Vladimir Putin, G- General Flynn and Jill Stein, and the, the proof is right there. I'm, I'm not making a toxic, you know, crazy observation here this is just, i'm just telling you water's wet right she got more votes in if, if if in michigan than trump won by same thing is true in wisconsin same thing is true in pennsylvania so there is a danger that the party particularly on its left flank is not unified now i got to give senator sanders credit he is he himself has been exemplary in this in, in this so far. Some people on the American left, and I mean the real left, you know, envision that, that Biden won't make it and that Sanders will come back and the revolution will go on. I, I don't think it's the case, but it, but it is it is a problem. It's a, <clears throat> it's a problem that uh, Vice President Biden has to deal with some dexterity, but that's what you expect in a politician, and some skill. <clears throat> but understand this. The Democratic voters, it wasn't the, I, I like that they all say, like, I'm part of the establishment. Yeah, yeah, I'm a LSU guy. You really think, of, uh, you know, it's really part of the establishment. But it wasn't the establishment that did them in. It was like voters in, you know, the Mississippi Delta or suburban voters in, in Northern Virginia. This was just a, a speaking out on part of the Democratic Party. Now, if they're smart, and I got to tell you, they, they think they're supposed to do pretty well in 2024. But if they stop Biden, if they stop the Democrats from having a Senate majority, people are not going to take well to it. I mean, I, I think this is a time for everybody to say, look, we got disagreements. We're not going to get them all settled between 9 and November. Let's get this guy out of there. Then we'll have that argument. But this is not the time for the argument. Sure. I, I should point out that, that Jill Stein denies um, those allegations, uh, suggesting that she was... Would you please have somebody pull the picture up with her and Flynn and Putin having dinner in Moscow? Now, you can believe that she wasn't paid to go there if you choose to, but I would suggest that you don't. Sure. Uh, um, uh, on... Oh, regardless of evidence, yeah, it's, it's probably still worth pointing out that she does, in fact, do you know, deny, deny, deny these allegations. But, but uh, well, more, she can deny the allegations. She couldn't deny it if she was sitting at at a banquet and on RT, all right, on Russian TV, giving interviews, criticizing the United States and saying nothing about Russia. That's a fact. Now, but a, 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 a mind can draw its own logical conclusions. Uh, mind just did. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, your, your 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 logical conclusions uh, aside on the matter of Jill Stein is is it I mean you've you've in the past described as Sanders followers as as a cult uh, and 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 a lot of a lot of whom quite plausibly as polling consistently shows don't approve of Biden and plausibly won't turn up to vote for him in an election. Do you, do you right. think the the impending threat of Trump being a, a unifier in that? Or, or, or is there still a lingering concern that that there will still, will still be sufficient numbers of outliers not turning up to vote 
to, that will be potentially cost by the election. It is a concern. It, it is very legitimate. Concern. And, and what I would say is, if you choose to be part of a cult, that, that you have like a single issue, or you, do, you know, you want the revolution, and everything, but you know what, it's a free country. You can be that, right? If you want to be successful, if you want to get something done, then you're part of a coalition. All great politicians it, who last have been able to build a coalition out. Coalition changes, it adapts. All right, and if you want, if you want to have influence in the coalition, and let's say you would be significantly to the left, my argument is, you 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 got you got to work within the coalition because if you're in the cult, <clears throat> you didn't do very well. All right, there was a race this week, a, a Democratic primary, Joyce Beatty, in Columbus, Ohio. All right, that's where Ohio State is. That's probably the the largest on-campus university in the United States. If it's not, it's it's, it's, it's close, all right? Big Ten school, huge, very, great university, great football team. And she was a, a, a kind of given a, she's a classic establishment African-American Democrat. You know, part of the caucus, you know, kind of Jim Clyburn, Nancy Pelosi, you know. And that, so against her, they ran an insurgent, a cultist. In that primary, she won like 69, 31. I mean, you got, you got to respect democratic voters, right? You live in a democracy. You may not like what they're doing, but they're pretty definitive about the kind of party that they want. And of course we got to, if we have any chance in Ohio, in Franklin County, which is where Columbus is, is which is where Ohio State, a lot of, there are a lot of other schools in, in Columbus also. I mean, it's, it's, it's packed with, what you would think of, I, I couldn't think of a outside of the coast, a place in the interior of the United States would be more favorable to a challenger of the Democratic coalition by cultists. It went very poorly. People are making a decision. You have to respect the people in the party and, and all across the Democratic Party, the African Americans, educated women, you name it. They are very definitive here. They want to get on with the business of beating Donald Trump. And that I understand, I respect America. I know where it, it's coming from. They're very disappointed. You know, in my, yeah, you might you might get the whole ball of wax in 2024. Sometimes I, I think I'm one third of Bernie bro myself. <laughs> when I get so mad at some of this stuff, I'm like, oh God. But right now I got, only one thing I'm worried about every day. How, to, how, to, how in the hell can I help just get this, whatever we got in there, out of there, pronto, fast? And that's it. For, for, for sure. I, I, I can actually just pick up, pick up on something we started to move on okay. to there in terms of the Democratic coalition sort of going forwards, because um, a, a lot has been made so of, uh, of the, the, the demographic splits within the primary. So, yeah. Joe Biden cleaned up largely among African Americans. Um, yeah, yeah. Bernie Sanders, um, you know, won among Hispanic voters. Um, but but overall, obviously, uh, Biden is is consistently winning at this point. You know, two thirds of the vote in, in in those primaries that are still occurring, and, and clearly got got the nomination locked up. But as, as as sort of we look forward, obviously the the United States is demographically changing. Um, yes. Minorities, particularly his, Hispanics, growing as a proportion of population. Um, how do you see that sort of influencing the, the electoral politics, politics of the future? Are there any sort of issues where the Democratic Party needs to move in order to effectively encompass these demographic changes? Right. Well, the first thing, you're exactly right. And young voters are much more open to what I would call the cult side of it, but that, I, I'd be kinder than that. But a more expansive uh, gov federal government, if you will, and it, more like a... There's no doubt about it. And even the split among African American voters, if, if you take attitudes of African Americans over 45 and compare it to, you know, younger, or I would say, it, it, the, the difference is pretty, a, a, a pretty stark. But, it, you know, but, but for whatever reason, older voters just turn out more. And, and Biden, you know, by age, 
clearly runs, you know, among, among the Democratic base, clearly does better with older voters. That is going to be something that the party is, and the country is going to have to address. For the moment, for just this moment, there's only one problem. That's Trump. It's, it's just the way I would say it is, you, you show up to the emergency room and you have a heart attack. And it says, look, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to deal with, with your diarrhea. But right now, let's, let's deal with the heart attack, okay? Then, you know, we'll deal with it later. And anything that distracts us from that mission only increases one thing, the chance that Trump is reelected. And, and what we're saying here is, and, and let's be honest, it's, very, it's highly likely that Biden will be a one-term president, just given the actuarial tables or whatever. It's highly likely. So you, the, the whole, if you're 24 years old, there's a, you've got a whole political future ahead of you to, to, make it, to make the coalition respect you and to have influence within the coalition and to move it. But right now, it's not that time. You, you had it. They had, Bernie Sanders had every chance in the world. He was in every debate. He raised more money than any of the other candidates. Biden didn't have a campaign, right? And, and he, was, he actually kind of wrote the party rules because everybody was so afraid of him. You lost. I'm sorry. He just did. And, sure. and, 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 and it wasn't the establishment that beat you, it wasn't anything. It was just rank and file Democrats saying, hey, this is the best way to get this guy out of here. And you got to respect that point of view. Now, do, do they have to respect the, that point of view? Of course they do. But I just would say right now is the time to put the revolution on hold and get the criminal out of there then you can fire up the revolution in engines in another couple, three years. That, 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 that's where I am. <laughs> no, no, fair enough, absolutely. Um, could, could I sort of like just, just narrow down slightly on, away from the presidential race now and sort of look sure. at the state level quickly? Um, as to what now? Uh, the, the state level, sorry, before we sure, went sure, 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 sure. So it's obviously that the, the Senate's um, being a, uh, the, having effectively you know, a veto over any significant legislation, um, right. may potential... Uh, so obviously you need a, a majority of 60 to pass lots of legislation, but uh, you, various ways you can fudge that rules as long as you have a majority, as long as you, uh, the majority leader is from your party, right? So, so, so the Democrats still um, are in the minority and, and they need a net pickup of what, three seats in, in November to, well, yeah, assuming, assuming Biden is, is um, assuming that Biden becomes the, the president and, and you know, the VP can cast any, uh, the deciding vote in any tie. So, so I, I guess the question I would have for you is, is how optimistic are you about democratic chances um, of, of retaking the majority in November? And how, how does that, is that sort of affected by uh, the, the, the broader up-ticket vote on, on Biden versus Trump? All right, very critical question. Because what happens? Let's assume Biden wins. It's 304 electoral votes. We lose two House seats, but Nancy Pelosi is still the speaker. And we have... We, we don't have the Senate. Mitch McConnell is still the majority leader. You know what will change? And John Roberts, of course, is still leads a, a, a Republican-dominated Supreme Court. You know what will change? Not very much. Mm -hmm. Not, not, nope. I mean, you, you'll have competent ambassadors and, you know, and things like that, but not much. We're on the precipice of what I call majoritarian dominance. And when you have an opportunity like that at a political party, like a pirate ship, you have to seize it. If you see a galleon out there that is loaded below the waterline with gold and going slow, all hands on deck. Come on, guys. We, we, we going, we're going for the big one here. We're not going to fool around. We're not letting this guy get away. And then you go and you, you board it. You seize all the gold. You burn the mass and leave it floating out there in the middle of hurricane season. That's what you do. So, if, let, let, so first of all, let's talk about the Senate in some detail because it's important. So we have the Alabama situation where Doug Jones, a good friend of mine, is up for re-election in a, in a very, very tough state. 
So that would, if Doug were to lose, that would put it at 54. You need, I think you need five at that point. Well, uh, well, uh, well, clearly the favorite in North Carolina, Arizona, Colorado, in Maine. All right, that, that I'm very comfortable about our chances. Then you go to other places that you have a big win. Montana, Governor Bullock, good friend of mine, he's tied right now. That was a great get that we got in Montana. Iowa, huge opportunity. Kansas, not that. Don't laugh. Kansas has a Democratic governor, and if they nominate Kovac, we could have a Democratic senator. Very, 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 very possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to hold Michigan, which we're likely to do. I actually, Georgia, there are two seats up. That Georgia is, is is very, very, very possible. It's very possible that you get one. I don't think we're, and I honestly believe this, we're not any worse than 45% in Texas. I mean, if you just look at what happened in 2018, and the Texas economy has obviously been slaughtered by the, the oil bust. But the other thing that has happened is, Texas is not like Louisiana, where I'm from, or Mississippi. They don't think like that. They are, it's a very, there's tons of educated people in Texas, and particularly tons of educated white women, right, who are going to be the key. So I, I, I put Texas in two seats in Georgia, uh, Iowa, Montana, Kansas, if, if, if we catch the right card, now you got to catch the right card now really, really in play. And if, if it got good enough, it would have to get pretty good. I, I, I would throw South Carolina in. I, I, South Carolina, North Carolina is the new Virginia. And I think South Carolina is going to be the new North Carolina. People tend to lump South Carolina in with Kentucky and Tennessee and Oklahoma and Arkansas. Not true. South Carolina's got affluent people moving in left and right. They got a lot of suburbs that their, their, their cook PVI, which is the expected democratic performance is minus eight. If you look across the board, if you're, since Trump has been elected on average, Democrats have been running about five points ahead of expected democratic performance. Mm -hmm. All right. They look in Wisconsin. We run eight points ahead of expected Democrats, maybe 10. All right, maybe in Florida in 2018, but across the board in every election, even the elections we lost, we were in half in North Dakota, Missouri, Indiana. I mean, states that were not going to win in the presidential election, unless it's as big as I hope it is, we still ran significantly ahead of Democratic performance. So that would produce right now, Hillary won by 2.1 of the popular vote. That would produce of what, uh, 7.1 popular vote win. Well, you're going to win, win a lot of shit at, at 7. I don't care how the distribution works out. You're going to win a lot. At a, a, and I, I think the potential is higher than 7.1. Because if you go to your, your original observation, which is very critical, every pollster tells me, and I talk to a lot of them, that we're running behind the congressional candidate, that there's... that, that Part of the electorate is recalcitrant. That that should be for us. That's something we do have to address. But but that, if we could take that seven point one, and I, we could turn it into to ten point one. I, I think the opportunity is there. And you know, go back to this political Presbyterianism. You know that well, Trump's going to get ninety four percent of Republicans. Yeah, that's right. That's a that's a that I'll, I'll buy that. That's a kind of static number. What happens is the number of Republicans go down or up. So the difference of getting 94 percent of 40 and 94 percent of 35 is a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. they, they don't assume, they don't calculate, they, they, when they go, talk about partisanship and they just look at the self-identified Democrats and the self-identified Republicans that vote a certain way, and some political scientists walk away from that <clears throat> saying there are no swing voters. And I'm like, no, look at what really changes is self-identification. So I ask you, what do you consider yourself? 
you know, a Republican or Democrat or what. And we sort of probe, are you strong, weak, independent people say independent. Well, we say, which way do you lean? Because that's, so the, the independent leaners that drive themselves as Democrats or the true independents or the independent leaners that describe themselves as Republicans, they shift back and forth. And some of them don't vote. And Trump will run ahead of some congressional Republicans for the simple reason that a lot of his voters, like him, don't much care about Republicans. They, they like his kind of grab your crotch, you know, F you sort of mentality that they don't like in the more kind of mainstream people. So that that is true. But also, like, you, you watch this thing in Michigan. You think suburban women are not watching these people with children going in there, you know, all, all white, all most 90, 80 percent male, you know, Confederate flags. And you stop and think of Europe, politically unaligned, 32 year old mother of two people. You're not going to be impressed with this at all, at all. And when you double down on that demographic, the rest of the country is watching. And that, that's what makes me, mm -hmm. and I have some friends that are Republican strategists, they must be going out of their goddamn minds right now. Uh, absolutely. Just just before I, but just before you have to go though, I'm kind of asking you one final question very quickly, James. Sure. What, so, so you, you obviously you have quite, quite an optimistic take on, on uh, you know, the potential for the Democratic Party to grow right. going forward. What's the worst case scenario for you? Well, I mean, worst case scenario is, you know, something that, that happens that I, I really don't think will, and I mean, that, that is catastrophic. I guess the worst realistic case is, is we, we win the presidency, hold on to the House and don't get the Senate. So, so you then, don't think there's any chance, there's no chance that, that, that Trump wins in November? Well, I don't, let's wait this way. Is any, any, any event that could happen, give it enough time and enough circumstances, might happen. I don't see any evidence, and I mean evidence, and I'm talking about, and I tell people, show me a, an election or a poll or anything. So he got 46.1 mm -hmm. in 2016. They got 44.8 in a really high turnout off the election. It's okay to extrapolate things in this because it was, it had a high Republican turnout. Across the board, again, Democrats are running five points ahead of expected performance. Mm -hmm. So anything could happen, but there's no evidence that I see that tells me that Trump is going to be reelected. Now, to me, it's a question of how much he loses by. And I, I'm, I'm not thinking about losing. I'm not just thinking about winning. I'm thinking about beating the shit out of them. All right. And that can happen. And, and if that happens, then, you, you know, so I like to watch these documentaries, you know, Battle of Stalingrad. And I was watching one and, you know, and, and they were marching these Nazi soldiers out. They were beaten, starving, depressed, that vacant look. Election night, the Republican Party, my dream is they look exactly like a beaten army. All right. And I think we can do that. And I think if we do that, we will have done not the United States a favor, but the entire world a favor. Church bells will be ringing across the UK. They'll be so happy. And on that slightly macabre or extremely opt like positive, optimistic note, depending on your political perspective, we say thank you very much, James. First of all, let me go with my guys. Now, the guys in the lab up there, I'm pulling for you. Go Oxford. <laughs> and, and likewise, congratulations uh, on, on LSU, obviously clearing up national title and everything else this year. Uh, best of luck with that, Joe Burrow, next year. All right, thank you. I hope to see you back at Oxford once this, once this passes. Uh, love all you guys. Absolutely. Thank you very much, James. You bet.